Yes, indeed, it is the Professor Buzzkill History Podcast here, busting myths, taking names. And one of the biggest myths in the United States, anyway, and in American history, is multiple myths about what rural America is and what rural America has been. And fortunately for you, and very fortunately for me, we have on the line via the internet Professor Stephen Kahn, whose new book, The Lies of the Land, Seeing Rural America for What It Is and Isn't, is out now and is one of the most important books I've read this year. It forms the basis of a great essay in a recent New Yorker article and is part of our What is America month this month. So, Professor, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. What astounded me most about the book, really, was how completely out of sync with reality a lot of the standard conceptions of what rural America is and what rural America was are. We seem to have painted this picture of rural America that not only doesn't exist now, but never existed, and in fact has sort of damaged our understanding of what the whole country is. That certainly is one of the things that surprised me when I decided to dig into this project. We can call it the pastoral ideal. We can call it the rural idol, the, the myth of rural places. They really were a creation from the late 18th century, first of a collection of aristocrats like Thomas Jefferson, who never picked up a plow in his life and had all of his farm labor done by by the dozens of slaves that he held. It was perpetuated in the 19th century also by a collection of writers, intellectuals, almost all of them, by the way, urban located. So, you know, the transcendentalists outside of Boston in the mid 19th century, it became a stock feature of all kinds of popular culture. You can find this in the 19th century in Courier and Ives prints, the kind of idyllic little small town with all the tidy people. You can see it a hundred years later in Norman Rockwell productions that essentially do the same thing. Radio shows, television shows, We invented a notion of what rural America was like, largely, I think, to satisfy the kind of urban ideal of what it ought to be, rather than what it really was, or really still is. That was one of the things I wanted to explore in this book. Well, what do you think, then, was the version of what it ought to be? I mean, as you say, there's a Jeffersonian ideal of the yeoman farmer being independent and all this sort of thing, and that progresses all the way through Courier and Ives and the idyllic landscapes and little towns and stuff like that, all the way to, frankly, modern-day Hallmark movies where, you know, the sophisticated New York businesswoman falls in love with a guy from the Bedford Falls. Yeah, yeah. And goes out to enjoy rural life. It does seem to be almost universal that it is a good thing. It is the pure and the right thing and that everything else is a departure from it. Part of the reason I did this book in the first place was as a kind of weird sequel to a book I did almost 10 years ago now, where I looked at what I called the anti-urban tradition in American life. And I looked at this idea and how it was developed and expressed in a by a variety of writers, critics, and whatnot. But I also looked at how that idea wound up shaping policy and specific places, especially across the 20th century. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. I think that part of what you see in this romanticization of rural life is a reaction against urban life. And let's do the numbers. Since 1790, when we first took the census, this country has been rapidly urbanizing. That is a uninterrupted trend line from 1790 to 2020. The decade with the most rapid urban growth in terms of percentages was actually the 1830s. Wow. I think what you're seeing is this reaction against this rapid urbanization and then and rapid industrialization, everything else that goes along with that, and looking for an alternative to that, somehow an antidote to this urbanization. Because as I said in that earlier book, one of the paradoxes of American life as I see it is that we are a highly urbanized, now now we would say metropolitanized nation. 75% of Americans live in a metropolitan area of more than 500,000 people. So that's where we live now. But we are filled with people who actually don't like cities very much. 
And it's that contradiction, that paradox, that I think keeps this rural myth alive. There's a place out there, out in the countryside, which is calm and quiet and filled mostly with white people and all the things that cities aren't. It's never been true, but I think we've had some sort of cultural impulse to keep that myth alive. Well, why do you think there is a cultural impulse to keep the myth alive, but also to keep the idea that that's the real America alive, when all the facts are the other way, right. but also there is this yearning for something that never existed? So that's a great question, and, and I'm not sure I have a great answer. One of the things that happens almost immediately and continues, as you just noted, right up to the present day, it's not just about a lifestyle that somehow is better out in the country, which, by the way, it, again, it it isn't and it never really has been in any measurable sense, but it's it's freighted with a kind of moral weight mm. as well. These are better people. They lead better lives. They are closer to the soil and nearer to God. And somehow that sticks with us, as I said, even though it's so far removed from reality. That one's tricky. I'm not sure why we have decided to load this moral weight onto rural people and rural places. That's a peculiar question. Well, I suppose when I think about it, you know, it's not uncommon in other countries. In England, there's the rural, idyllic English village. In Ireland, there's, you know, the real Irish people are out in right. countryside. In France, the rural peasant and all, all sorts of things. The Italian, the, the rural olive grove farmer. I guess it's not uniquely American, but it does seem to be strong. And we seem to be one of a few countries where politically, in terms of representation, the rural areas are overrepresented yeah. and overly pandered to. You're much better off living in rural Wyoming than you are living in California, urban California. California in terms of political representation in Washington, D.C. I'm sorry to go on so long about no, that. No, no, no. That, you're, you're absolutely right. Our, our national politics has always overrepresented rural areas. And we all know about the Electoral College because we've been fighting about that over the recent past. That carries down to state levels as well. I think if you look at state legislatures, you will discover that those districts have historically overrepresented the rural parts of those states. The Supreme Court's decision that sort of clarified the one person, one vote principle, which I think came out in 61, 62, came from the state of Illinois, where they hadn't redrawn the district boundaries since 1900. So even though like 75% of the people in Illinois lived in Cook County, they only, I'm making this up, they had five representatives in the state house, whereas these rural districts that had nobody living in them anymore had all kinds of representation. So that's always been true. And as I said, I think that's kind of wired into this anti-urban feeling that we've always had in the United States. I think your reference to Europe is instructive as well, because we never did have those separate, autonomous, whatever you want to call them, self-sufficient rural cultures in the way that did develop over centuries in places like Ireland and England and France. From the very outset, rural development in this country, especially agriculture and then extractive industries, has always been driven by urban capital, urban technologies, urban people, and so on and so on and so forth. So there never really was, with a couple of exceptions, like Amish communities in Pennsylvania and Navajo, you know, Pueblo communities in the Southwest, if we want to talk about original inhabitants of rural America. But by and large, the development of rural America has never been like it was in Europe, has always been driven by urban forces. Yeah. And as you point out clearly in the book, the period of an American homestead, American, I don't mean homestead then in the homestead accents, but an American farm, an American farmer working his own land, selling his own crops and being independent in that way. If such a thing ever existed, it was for a very, very short period. Yeah. Where I sit out in what we used to call the Western Reserve and then the Ohio Territory, settlers start flooding into this area after the American Revolution. They start setting up farming. And then almost immediately, the next thing that starts to happen is canal building. And the reason you're building canals is precisely to ship this agricultural product to larger markets elsewhere. It's never about establishing little communities where people are simply or only growing things for their own use and maybe selling a little bit on the side. What they want immediately is access to national markets. So canals get built. It links Cincinnati with New York City through the canal, through the lakes, and so on and so forth, down the Hudson River. People who are growing apples or corn or 
pigs in the hinterlands of Ohio want to be selling them in New York or Chicago or New Orleans. That was true from the get-go. And that's true across most of agricultural America. And does that work to a large degree? Do people live this dual life where they, they're actually producing for urban markets and yet living, and I'm putting living in quotation marks, plus killers, what's seen as a rural, pure life? You know, they've got the clapboard house and, right. and, and surrounded by small places. And there's sort of the projection both inward and outward of rural, sturdy, honest America. But in reality, you're selling all your stuff to those corrupted urbanites. Right, right. I would say no. One of the things that I thought was remarkable, and, and other historians have done more work on this than I have, is just how mobile, in the 19th century especially, all of these farmers are. They'll stake out a plot, and then they'll pick up and leave and they'll move someplace else. So the, the idea that these people are, in some almost literal sense, rooted to the soil, the demographics the just doesn't bear that out. My favorite example of this, because you know it is a kind of cultural touchstone for us, are the Ingalls family of Little House on the Prairie fame. Yeah, Those were a series of novels in the 1930s, which then, of course, got turned into a TV show in the 1970s. I'm sure you can still find it out there in the in the land of ever streaming syndicated reruns. <laughs> in reality, Pa Ingalls was a terrible farmer, and that family moved all the time. His first homestead claim was outside Mankato, Minnesota, 1863, right after the Sioux War with the federal government. They picked up and moved. They picked up and moved again. They picked up and moved one more time. And they finally settled in town where Pa ran a little business. That's not the story that you get from the Little House on the Prairie novels. It's it's about the, the wholesomeness of farm life and the self-sufficiency of the family unit and so on and so forth. But I think in some ways, the real Ingalls story is much more typical of what happened out there. There's a thing, in again, in Ohio, if your farm has been around for a century, you get a special state designation, a plaque you can put on the barn and whatnot. There aren't very many of them. But think about that in a European context. Like a century is nothing. Yeah, That's as long as some of these farm operations have existed in a continuous sort of way. The other thing that I think, of course, happens with these farmers in a, a very literal sense is that from the middle of the 19th century, farming itself becomes industrialized and it industrializes yes. rapidly, which means that it means two things, most obviously. The first is less and less labor required. My favorite little factoid about this is that in 1865, it took about 61 hours of human labor to produce an acre of wheat. And by 1890, that figure was down to three hours. Astounding. Just astounding. It's astounding, right? Because, well, in 1865, you were doing it with a horse and a plow. And by 1890, you're doing it with a McCormick Reaper and a John Deere tractor and everything else. Well, that means that fewer and fewer people are needed to work the land. And it also drives the consolidation of farming units altogether. Farms just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I looked this up last week for a, another essay I was writing. The average size of a farming operation now in the state of Montana is over 2,000 acres. So we're a long way <laughs> from that 160-acre homestead farm ideal that we created in the middle of the 19th century. It's 900 acres in Kansas, and it's 1,000 acres in Nebraska. This has happened all across the midsection of the country. But the last thing I'll say in response to your question is that somewhere along the way, I think rural people themselves began also to absorb the myth about themselves that urban writers and artists had created in the first place. So I think at least for many of these folks, they did cling on to some sense that they were the real Americans. They represented the Jeffersonian tradition after all, and never mind what their lives were really like. I think they absorbed this myth along with the rest of us. You know, I'm, I'm continually astounded as long as I've done this show. I'm a British historian, Irish historian by training and rediscovering American history through this show at how continually false and enduringly false, if you will, the Jeffersonian yeah. ideal yeah. was. I mean, Lord, you, did it last maybe 40 years? Maybe. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Leaving aside the slavery, leaving aside this, the fact that it's all, all the work is done by slaves, that yeoman thing 
just yeah. isn't true or isn't true for very long. Let's acknowledge that there's a certain appeal to it. Let's acknowledge that the, yes. for, for lots of people, the idea that I am rugged and individualist and I'm a pioneer and I'm doing this on my own and so on and so forth, there is an appeal to that. And it certainly would seem, let's go back again to the early 19th century, it's a figure that represents the antithesis of your British and Irish peasants who are stuck where they are, who are trapped in feudal arrangements of land holding and land owning. So it represents an alternative to that, an opposite of that. And the fact that it isn't true is somehow not nearly as important as just how appealing it really is for people and how much they hang on to it. But I just want to go back to chronology just for a second. When you were giving us the comparison between 1865 and 1890 in the industrialization, I would have said, before I learned about this, I would have said, in fact, I would have even said to students, college students, that the industrialization of agriculture happens in the early 20th century. Yeah. And in reality, it happened 50 years before that. And 50 years in the life of this country is of course a big percentage. Yeah. I think the John Deere Company is founded in 1837 in the middle of Illinois and producing now mechanized farm equipment. And that, you know, we're not quite yet at coal and and steam and eventually gasoline and so forth, but but that's the trend. That's where it's headed. Which also means the other side of the same coin is that farmers who want access to that kind of technology need access to finance. And so the financialization of agriculture, along with the industrialization of agriculture, sort of go hand in glove. So that also starts in the middle of the 19th century. You go out and you stake your homestead claim for your 160 acres, which you get for free. We could talk about how that may constitute the greatest socialist land redistribution project in human history. Again, I think another myth that Americans don't want to Yeah, the uh, Homestead Act, yeah. But what you then did out there in Kansas was to turn around and mortgage that farm to some banking operation in order to raise more capital to buy more land or more equipment. So farmers are involved in the financialization of the economy also from the get-go. And this is very sophisticated stuff. Yep. The Pa Angles thing of out there behind the plow, yep. a horse drawn plow and all that stuff is just, it's not true. Well, in the Ingalls case is a bad example because he, as you say, is a failed farmer, but the successful farmers work like small businessmen. Yep. And all yeah. that entails the finance and everything. In 2007, we all tried to get our heads around the concept of securitized mortgages because that's what mm -hmm. imploded the financial system. The first securitized mortgage instruments were actually created by banks using farms. That's what they were doing. So the, the inventories of these banks holding farm mortgages in the middle of the 19th century, this is where that bit of finance all begins. So it is very sophisticated. It is, as I said, highly industrialized. In the 1920s, the International Harvester Corporation, which was a a conglomerate of lots of other farm implement makers was running an ad campaign to farmers under the banner, Every Farm a Factory. And that was, that's the 1920s. So that's the ideal. That's the goal is not to be Pa Ingalls. It's to be a factory, a large scale, highly efficient production instrument. In the 1950s, what I discovered digging around in this for this book was that family farming operations turned themselves into limited liability corporations. So when you look at these family farms, chances are, if you were to dig through the legal documents, what you're looking at is something that has been incorporated. And that's for all kinds of reasons. They get tax advantages for this. They get liability stuff from this. But mostly, it's a way of passing the farm down without dealing with all the hassles of the kind of straightforward inheritance stuff. So the corporation continues to exist from generation to generation, and we don't fight now over who owes the taxes and which of the kids is going to get the farm and so on and so forth. So again, it, this is in the 1950s. Farmers are busy with lawyers incorporating. Yes, yeah, yes, amazing. Pa Engels spends as much as, uh, almost as much time at his kitchen table working on financial paperwork as he does right. out, out, out behind the, behind right. the plow. 
But then the thing perhaps that astounded me the most, because I sort of knew a lot of this stuff before, but the thing that astounded me the most was really looking at, in the early 20th century, first half of the 20th century anyway, the treatment of rural life and rural culture as a kind of idyll by people like the Lomaxes yep. and the Federal Slave Narrative Project. But we should tell foreign buzzkillers that, that these were various groups of people who decided at a certain time, uh-oh, rural America is is dying or, or going away. We need to go out and capture and record, first of all, slave narratives. Some slaves are still alive, and that seems very important. The Lomaxes were two brothers who went out and tried to record, or literally record, audio record, but also write down old folk tales and especially folk music in Appalachia as this idea that that's, again, that's the purest form of American yeah. cultural life. That's the real America. And that's that. I look at that now completely differently, having read your book. What I think happens in the 20s and 30s in particular is a desire to find real American folk. And since there really isn't very much of it, so the Lomaxes wind up in finding in these tiny little out-of-the-way places. In, in Appalachia, yes, but they also spend time in the Mississippi Delta. And let's be clear, the recordings that they did are a treasure. You can, I think you can access them on the Library of Congress website. Yes, we're very glad that they did it. That's yeah. right. We are better off for having them. But I think it's driven by this notion that that America ought to have a real folk the way other nations have a folk. And so, sure, there's a little bit of it. But in terms of what's really going on, there's very little of it, I would say. I think that what happens in the early 20th century, and let me take two steps back, those kind of moral claims about rural life in the 19th century could be backed up in a couple of ways particularly lifespan and living conditions. If you lived in New York City in the 1840s and you were a working class person, you'd come from Ireland, let's just take that as it, your life was pretty miserable in a lot of ways and your life expectancy was shorter. So it was easy to believe that life in the country was just healthier for you. You would live longer. People talked in the 19th century about how people in the city have kill themselves. They have suicide rates, you know, and out in the country, we don't do any of that. By the turn of the 20th century, and especially during the progressive era, all of that stuff begins to change. And it changes because life in the cities modernizes in all kinds of ways that it doesn't in the countryside. So now all of a sudden, thanks to the progressive reformers, we all have clean running water through plumbing, indoor plumbing in our apartment buildings in New York City. Right? This is astonishing. And life expectancies begin to increase. Urbanites begin to enjoy the benefits of first gas lighting and then electric lighting and all these other things which rural people now don't have. And I think it's in that context that people double down on the idea that, well, it's still better out here because it's more moral. It's it, it, right. They sort of double down on all the mythology because the experience now of urban life is in some measurable ways just better. Your access to health care, your access to education, transportation, employment opportunities, all these things are just demonstrably better now in a big urban center than they are increasingly out in the countryside. And also we see the great migration for people leaving rural areas and going to urban areas. And that's not that's not a brand new thing. I mean, there are some really big movements, especially from the South to the North, but that's been going on almost the whole time. As I dug around, the first reports of this in the press that seem kind of shocked and, and, and upset come after the 1910 census. So even before the so-called Great Migration starts, what the census numbers are documenting is that people are leaving rural areas especially again in the, in the national midsection. And that continues apace. In the 1960 census, something like 75% of the rural counties, again, between the Appalachians and the Rockies, let's say, lost population as that exodus continues. I think a lot of your listeners will know the Great Migration of the epic movement of Black Southerners out of the South and into Northern cities. 
Less well-known may be the Great White Migration, especially in the 30s and post-Second World War era when Texans and Oklahomans left for California and Kentuckians, West Virginians, Tennessee folk left for Ohio and Michigan. I don't think that's has been as well studied, but maybe as many as 4 million people left those rural places and moved up north, again, looking for jobs because that's the driver of that kind of migration. So yeah, a lot of rural parts of the country have, have simply been shrinking. You can go through some of these small towns in Kansas and well, even in, in Ohio as well, and notice that they hit the peak of their population right around the First World War, and then they decline. Yes. That's sort of remarkable. We think about the the urban population collapse after the Second World War in a lot of these small towns that used to function, let's say, as a railroad depot or an agricultural center or something. That population collapse happens 100 years ago. Another thing that really surprised me in the book was what sort of replaced a lot of this, a lot of this population, but also what replaced, if you will, the empty space. And empty space is a very sort of contested yep, term. It's yep. not exactly well defined. But in your book, part one is the military. Mm -hmm. About how the military has come to be one of the dominant entities in rural America. Yep. This, this astounded me. Of course, it makes sense once you read what you, you've analyzed. But just don't think that the family farm is being replaced by airfields and all that stuff, but that's exactly what happened. Yeah. I think this is especially true in the rural South, where it is both a, a strategic decision on the part of the army, but also an economic development decision being driven in Washington. This starts in the First World War, accelerates during the Second World War, put those bases down there, and it's a source of revenue for communities that otherwise don't have a whole lot going on economically. The best count that I got was that the U.S. military facilities in this country occupy an area approximately the size of Kentucky, and almost all of that is in rural areas. Navy shipyards have traditionally been located, you know, kind of in urban areas on the coast. That's sort of, you need the water, but otherwise, the Army and the Air Force have occupied rural places. This has a bunch of consequences. It transforms the ecologies, both social and economic, of those places. I, I study a place in the book, Fort Hood, Texas, which starts as an army training base during the Second World War, is now, I think, the largest army base in the country. So this was a scrub area of ranches and farms in Texas, and now it is this enormous military base with a particular kind of economy that tends to revolve around used car dealerships, pizza shops, and strip clubs. And that's a transformation of rural life. The Air Force sets up its bases after the Second World War, both the missile installations, but also the air bases themselves, also in rural parts of the country. And communities become dependent on this spending. I, in the book, I actually call it addicted because they simply count on these dollars from Washington to come in. It drives everything else. It drives all of the ancillary businesses that support the base. It creates populations for the school systems. All this stuff, these communities are absolutely dependent on that military spending. And of course, the military is the largest entity in the federal government. So again, this is all part of the rural economy relying on the federal government at yeah. the same time that the image is of the independent yeoman farmer making it on his own and not needing Washington, D.C. And again, it, you continue with this because part three, I don't want to give away the entire book because we won't want people to get it and read it because it's so gripping, but part three is called Rural Inc. Sloganeering way to say this would be the Walmartization yeah. of rural America. And when you drive in rural America, that's what you see over and over and over, big box chain stores. So I think one of the things I wanted to do in that section was to say, look, this kind of opposition that we have in our imaginations between the small mom and pop Main Street shop and the big Wall Street corporate entities, that's all wrong. 
these large scale corporations are rooted in rural places and make their money in rural places. And we, we can say that that's good or bad. That's, that's up for a reader to decide. But we can't pretend that rural places have been hostile to large scale corporations. I looked at Dollar General in the book because I was astonished that nobody had actually written about this before. There are something like, I'm going to get this approximately right, 3,500 big box Walmart stores around the country. There are roughly $18,000 generals. Now, I say roughly because 18, it's 18,000. It, it's, a, it's a kind wow. of Heisenberg uncertainty problem. They open and close <laughs> so quickly that by the time you finished counting, the number has already changed. And they're very proud of this. They can open a store in 24 hours. They can close a store in 24 hours. All in rural places, right? Certainly for the first... 60, 70 years of Dollar General's existence. So this is how people in rural places now experience their retail lives, that it's at Walmart, it's at Dollar General. It's not at the local five and dime on Main Street in the little town anymore. Those places are long gone. And if you drive through these towns, as I have done quite a lot of, it is a sad sight when you come down a lot of these Main Streets because those storefronts are empty or they've been replaced with social service projects of one kind and another antique stores, because that's what these places have left to sell. And again, it's not that they've been hostile to this. They've embraced it. Dollar General started in a small town in Kentucky. Walmart started in a very small town in Arkansas. So rural folks have been not left behind by the march of corporate America. They've been at the front of the parade. Well, finally, if you don't mind me asking, and I don't want our listeners to think that I'm moralizing or, or claiming that urban spaces are superior in some ways, but there's been a lot of talk in the last 10 years about drug use in rural communities going through the roof. You say your students sometimes joke about what part of Ohio can be considered the heroin heartland yep. in 21st century America, and lots of urbanites are continually stunned by, for instance, I, whenever, when I, when I lived in Pittsburgh, whenever I would drive out of the city, almost as soon as you left the city and the suburbs of the city, the first thing you see are sex shops, strip clubs, gambling. It's almost as if there's a line that you cross and it's the anti-pure rural life that's, that's actually out there. Yeah. And it, it's very stark and it's very, very immediately visible. So I just wonder, first of all, how that happened, but also if rural people still have the idea of the idyll when all around them things are not idyllic. Yeah. So, right. Great question. And I'll, I'll just speculate a, a little bit about that. One of the things that I do think differentiates rural spaces from urban ones, at least that I've noticed, is the centrality of churches in rural places. They function not just religiously, or let's say that's the wrong way to put it. Religion also means your contact with community. In places where unions have all disappeared, where ethnic organizations uh, you know, have evaporated, where the local schools have all been consolidated. So in fact, your kid's high school is 45 minutes away, and that's no longer a point of contact. Churches become really central in a way that's not true in urban places. Okay. So that, I think, allows some people at any rate to kind of square the circle that you were just describing. Yeah, it's, it's about Oxycontin and strip clubs and and whatnot, but we go to church on Sundays and we believe in in Jesus and we oppose abortion and therefore, which rural people do at much higher percentages than than urban people do. So I, I think that that version, that American flavor of Christianity, enables people to live with these what would otherwise seem contradictory things at the same time. I do think that part of the, the problem we have in talking about any of this is precisely that the myth of rural America keeps getting in our way. When crack exploded in New York City in the late 70s and 80s, and when heroin exploded in New York City before then, a lot of people just kind of nodded their heads and said, yep, it's Sodom and Gomorrah. They get what they deserve. When it happens- Yeah, now, they, people expected it. Exactly. Yeah. And by the way- It didn't they surprise deserve, them. Yeah. 
That's right. It confirmed what they already believed about urban spaces. When this stuff uh, is is kind of inescapable now in rural areas, it, it's very difficult for people to process because it shouldn't be like this. And this is why we've responded nationally in a much different way. I mean, I'm not complaining about this, but when crack hit in urban centers in the 1980s, we invented mass incarceration. When crystal meth ran rampant all over middle America, we started talking about compassion and treatment. And I think it's rooted in race, but it's also like who's using these drugs. But it's also rooted in the sense that, well, if rural people are doing this, then something must, yeah, that's a serious problem that we really need to address. When urban people do it, we should just lock them up. Yes, but continually we have this rhetoric, especially politically, about the purity of rural people. So as you say in the book, this Sarah Palin was perhaps the most obvious example of this, sure. talking about how rural people are, are genuine Americans and everyone else is an urban d- degenerate. And yep. Trump would go out and not only say that, that rural people are the soul of America, but that we're going to bring back old-fashioned agriculture, we're in fact bring back coal mining, yeah, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people lap it up when, when in reality none of this stuff yeah. is ever going to happen. In fact, it's almost impossible to happen. Yet we believe this stuff almost as if it's from the Bible. One of the things that I have always been impressed by is that since the 1960s, Gallup has done a periodic survey of where Americans report they would like to live. And again, most Americans, 50, depending on how you count it all up, a, a majority of Americans now live in the suburbs. The vast majority of us live in a metropolitan area, which includes a central city and the surrounding suburbs. But what Americans report, a plurality of them would like to live in a small town. And so it's that yearning that just, which is why that political rhetoric continues to play. It's not simply a play to the actual people. It's a play to all of those people who wish they were or pretend that they would like to be living in a small rural place. Oh, that, that's actually interesting. I hadn't thought of that because, so you're, you're actually appealing to the people who live in suburban Detroit Yep. By saying they want to live out in rural Michigan, right. or small town Michigan, but actually that for all sorts of reasons, they live in the metropolitan. Yeah. And, and by the way, that they don't they don't actually want to live there. One of the fun little bits that I dug up for this book was a couple of court cases that resulted when suburban developments showed up in agricultural areas because they were out there looking for that Courier and Ives print. And then these these new residents in these new developments wound up suing the few remaining farmers who were there for noise, for bad smells. I mean, I found a case from Western Ohio where this pig farmer who'd been there for two generations was sued out of business because these new suburbanites didn't want to have to smell a pig farm. So so they they think they want to live out in a rural area next to the farm, but they actually don't. And the court cases tell that story. <laughs> yeah, well, having lived abroad, I'm continually astounded, and I'm, I'm sure I'm overgeneralizing, that Americans are probably the most self-deluded population that I know of. I mean, I hate to say that because overwhelmingly our listeners are American. We really do believe things that are literally, we believe a lot of things that are literally untrue. Yes. All of us have to get through our day with some number of rationalizations. And I think what, of course, is interesting about the kinds of myths that I was exploring in this book are not only the content of the myths themselves, but what gets erased in the process of believing them. What I would say that the number one erasure that happens as a consequence of this rural, this myth of rural America is the role of the federal government, which has been central to rural life from the very beginning, from 1790. And it's the one thing that rural people will tell you is absolutely not true. Can I make fun of Barry Goldwater for just a moment? Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, it's almost a requirement (laughs) here at the Institute. So when Barry Goldwater, that, that you know, kind of the, the, the prototype of the libertarian U.S. senator, campaigned for president in 1964, one of his stump speech lines was how hard work and pioneer spirit made the desert bloom. He's from Arizona, right? Well, that's all well and good. Hard work, absolutely, pioneer spirit, and billions and billions of gallons of federally subsidized water created by a whole series yeah. of federal dam projects and irrigation projects that go all the way back to the Teddy Roosevelt administration. So I suspect Goldwater knew that, 
he's not dumb, but I think he just could not reckon with it in the mythology that he had created about independence, hard work, and the evil nature of the federal government. Right. Arizona wouldn't exist were it not for federal water projects. It would simply be a desert. And so, as I said, I think what gets erased in some ways is just as interesting and important as what the content of this myth is all about in the first place. Well, and Goldwater's own family business relied on federal yes. land grants and federal subsidies. Of I mean, that's right. He was the least liber his family anyway, the least libertarian American of that period. Yeah. But yet he right. went and preached it. So it's again the thundering weight of all these myths is just amazing and never ceases to astound me. But I'm so grateful that you came on the show, Professor. And we want to thank you for doing that. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is a great conversation. I really appreciate it. And yeah, thank you for plugging the book. And And I hope the listeners had fun with this. And also thank you for, for writing the book. And I'm so glad that it got that big splash in The New Yorker because a lot of people learn more about it. So again, thanks for coming on the show. Buzz Killers, The Lies of the Land, Seeing Rural America for What It Is and Isn't is, of course, on the Buzzkill Bookshelf for you to go again get. And we will talk to all of you out there next week. Mm-hmm.